uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Daniel uh, Peralta Salas from uh, ICMAT. Uh, he'll speak about optimal domains for the first curl eigenvalue. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first of all, uh, thanks uh, Dima for uh, the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be Montreal again, although virtually. Uh, so, uh, the, of course, uh, you can ask questions during the talk if you want, no problem. Uh, I don't know what's the procedure. Uh, maybe you can just uh, type in the chat and, the, and Dima uh, reads the question or you can switch on the microphone. It's up to you. It's not a problem for me. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about optimal domains for the first eigenvalue of the curl operator. So the, the very first uh, thing I want to say is that uh, very surprisingly, this uh, problem, which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite natural and uh, basic, fundamental, is not, uh, is almost not studied in the literature. You almost cannot find uh, any reference about, about this question. Although I think it's, uh, it's quite relevant in several contexts of mathematical physics, such as uh, fluid mechanics or electromagnetism, where the, where the curl operator appears quite often. So, uh, so, so, uh, so I think this, this talk is, uh, is not only an, adverti an advertisement of uh, our results uh, together with my colleague uh, Alberto Enciso, but also I want to advertise uh, the problem itself because maybe some of you uh, have uh, new ideas to address it. It's, uh, it's open in general, widely open. Uh, and I think we need uh, new ideas to, to understand it. It's, it's quite, uh, when, when Alberto and I started to study this, it was quite annoying to us that we cannot answer this question. It's very annoying. Okay, so, and to show you why it is annoying, uh, I, I want to introduce, uh, let's say, general context of these sort of questions, which is the very classic that everyone who, who, who knows, or who has studied uh, spectral theory, uh, knows, uh, which is optimal domains for the first second value of the Laplacian operator. So, so I'm going to consider during this talk uh, omega. Omega is a, is a domain that I'll assume it's uh, bounded and the boundary is smooth enough. A domain of R3 and a smooth C2 uh, alpha boundary is, is okay for our purposes. So we consider the, the classical spectral problem for the Dirichlet Laplacian. So this defines uh, a well spectral uh, problem uh, with uh, for the eigenfunctions of k, uh, which uh, vanish on the boundary of the domain, and uh, this has a discrete spectrum. Uh, the first eigenvalue is positive and it's simple actually, and then you have the rest of the eigenvalues uh, that accumulate just at infinity. So in this uh, this setting of the of the well known. Uh, spectral problem for the Dirichlet Laplacian uh, for domains in Euclidean space, we have the faber crane inequality, which is a classic result that appears in all the textbooks on, on spectral theory. So it says that the first eigenvalue of the, of the Dirichlet Laplacian of this domain omega is lower bounded uh, by a constant that depends only on the volume of the domain omega. This C3 is, is a very explicit constant in terms of, of a seed of a vessel function. And actually this uh, inequality, uh, which holds for any, for any domain, is uh, sharp in the sense that is, uh, is achieved if and only if uh, the domain is a ball, okay? For, for the fixed volume, the volume that you have fixed a priori. So in particular, concerning uh, the problem, the optimality problem uh, that we are interested in here, uh, this implies that the ball is the only, uh, is the unique optimal domain, uh, which means that any other domain uh, with the same volume uh, that is not a ball uh, should have, must have a larger first eigenvalue lambda one. Okay. So uh, the problem is, uh, so what are, one can study uh, optimal domains, the same sort of optimal condition, for the first second value of uh, other operators, uh, let's say vector valued operators, which are which are more difficult uh, because the classic the classical proof of the Faber-Crane inequality does not work uh, 
very well in this context. So in this, in the setting of vector value operators, of course, uh, we have the curl operator, which we can say, uh, I think safely, that is the simplest, it's a first order uh, vector value operator, uh, linear, of course, and uh, most important vector operator, at least in some context of mathematical physics, such as fluid mechanics, where you have the vorticity, that is the curl of the velocity field, or electromagnet uh, electromagnetism, where you have the magnetic field, that is the curl of the of a vector potential, etc. So, uh, so next, I want to introduce the curl operator. So we have, of course, the the curl differential operator, which is studied. Uh, uh, by any by any student in the vector calculus uh, class, uh, but we have to 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 define in a good way uh, the the operator in in a functional analytic uh, setting to uh, define what the spectrum means for this operator. So I'm going to consider uh, this is what I'm going to do in this slide. Uh, so I'm going to consider the spectral problem: curl of uk is equal to mu k uk. Mu k are taken values. Actually, these, these vector fields UK are uh, called Beltrami fields in the literature of uh, fluid mechanics and also MHD, magnetohydrodynamics. And uh, so now I have, I, I have to, de to define the domain of this uh, operator, of this vector operator. And uh, we say to, for this, we, we consider eigenfunctions UK that are vector fields that belong to this space. So I'm going to use this, this space along the talk. Uh, it's k of omega, and it's formed by the L2 vector fields. The v is a vector field, not the scalar function. The L2 vector fields in, in omega, which are divergence-free, which are tangent uh, to the boundary of the domain, and which are, which are L2 orthogonal to all the harmonic fields of the domain. So by harmonic fields, this h omega, is the space of the linear space of harmonic fields. This is just uh, the vector fields uh, such that they have zero curl, curl of h is equal to zero, divergence free and tangent to the boundary. This turns out to be a finite dimensional uh, vector spa space. Actually, the dimension is the first Betty number of the domain uh, of this bounded domain with boundary. That's why the name of harmonic fields. And uh, the result, which is uh, classical, in this setting, uh, it was proved uh, by Higa and Yoshida already 30 years ago, is that uh, indeed uh, one can define a, a, a meaningful spectral problem for, for an appropriate domain in this space. So Cal defines, uh, defines an, an operator that it's actually self-adjoint on omega with compact resolvent and whose domain is, uh, we call it the omega, is dense, has a domain dense here in this k of omega. And actually, this is nothing else that the H1 fields uh, here, whose curl also belongs to this space. And actually, and turns out to be dense in K omega. So it's essentially self adjoint in K omega. So in particular, this has this curl has infinitely many eigenvalues, uh, discrete eigenvalues, uh, positive and negative. This is an important an important uh, difference with the with the Laplacian. Minus the Laplacian is a positive operator. Uh, here, uh, this has sign, so you have um, mu minus one, mu minus two, etc., and mu one, mu two, mu three, etc. And these are negative eigenvalues, these are positive eigenvalues, and they only accumulate at plus and minus infinity. So we have um, well defined the spectral problem for the curl operator in this context. Uh, an important remark uh, I want to stress here is that uh, in this space, so let's think uh, of this domain, just, uh, just the vector fields, which are divergence-free, tangent to the boundary, and uh, orthogonal to the harmonic fields. We are not prescribing the tangential component of the, of the vector fields, of the, of the Kell eigenfields. And, and it cannot be prescribed, actually. So this is, a, this is a difference, for example, of course, with the dirichlet laplacian With the dirichlet laplacian you prescribe the value of your eigenfunction to be zero on the boundary. Here in particular, for example, if we prescribed the value of our, of our Beltrami field, of our uh, eigenfield to be zero on the boundary, a sort of Dirichlet condition, this would imply that, uh, that the field is zero everywhere. So not, not only that you cannot say that it's zero uh, on the boundary, but in general, you cannot prescribe the tangential component. 
Okay, this is the first remark. And a second remark is that, uh, in fact, uh, you have, uh, although the curl, the curl operator is not elliptic because the symbol is a matrix that is anti-symmetric, so it's, it's the, the determinant is zero, but, uh, but the, the square of the curl, it's, it gives you the, the Laplacian. And then uh, you can prove uh, that, uh, that the fields are actually infinity or smooth in the domain. And up to the boundary, they have good regularity. C1 alpha, because we assume the boundary to be smooth enough. Okay, and the same holds for harmonic fields. Okay, so now we are uh, ready to, to define uh, the main uh, concept of this talk, which is uh, optimal domain, what uh, optimal domain is. So we say that a domain omega is optimal or a weaker condition locally optimal if uh, for the uh, for the first positive eigenvalue if uh, if mu 1 omega the first positive eigenvalue of omega is smaller or equal or equal than the first uh, curl eigenvalue for any other domain omega prime uh, of the same volume okay uh, this is the case of optimal so this is a global condition and in the case of local optimality we say that this holds only for any small perturbation Omega prime of omega, which has the fixed volume, same, uh, same volume as, as omega. And the same analogous condition for the first negative eigenvalue, taking the absolute value, for example. Okay, so we have the, the definition, and the problem is uh, very simply stated. So, which are, who are the optimal domains for the KL operator? Uh, for the Dirichlet Laplacian, we saw that uh, the optimal domain, the unique optimal domain, is the ball. What happens for the curl? So uh, the first uh, point to stress here, which is quite surprising, at least to me, is that almost there is no literature on this question. There are uh, there is uh, some literature, not much still, uh, even in this case, but uh, related, although different uh, optimization problems in the context of an object that I'm not going to introduce, uh, which, which is called helicity and is related to the curl operator. Uh, for, uh, of compactly supported vector fields, uh, but by many people, uh, Cantarella, Friedman, and Hay, Lawrence, and Estreduliski, etc. But exactly this problem that I'm addressing here has not been studied. Uh, the closest uh, problem is the one considered by Cantarella for the helicity. I will mention, I will talk a bit about this uh, later. Okay. So this is the, the problem that we want to consider. Who are the optimal domains for the first positive negative Kell eigenvalue. Okay, so uh, in, in the talk, I'm going to focus mainly on axisymmetric domains. So uh, I want to introduce some definitions, some of them very, very standard. So uh, to, to describe optimal domain, uh, sorry, axisymmetric domains as usual, uh, I consider cylindrical coordinates, uh, set R phi, and, uh, and I will denote the set axis by this capital set. Okay, so uh, the first observation is that, of course, if omega is axisymmetric uh, with axis of symmetry, this set axis, then uh, the complement of omega, omega minus the set axis, can be described this, this way. Set and R belong to a certain section, uh, D, co contained in the, in the half space set R, so R, R times zero infinity, and phi is the angle, so, and this is called the section. Of the, of the axisymmetric domain. And I'm going to introduce uh, some notation, uh, which, is, uh, which is this one here. So the distance, so the, the distance from a point X to the set axis, this is simply the, the R coordinate, the cylindrical R coordinate is denoted by Rx. Then uh, I define the, the quantity delta omega. Delta omega is the, is the distance the, the, the infimum of all the of all the distances uh, of a point x to the set axis, the infimum of this r of x for x in the boundary, uh, sorry, for x in the domain omega. So uh, with this uh, object, we can define this r omega and r d, which are very important objects in this talk. And this is this r omega is nothing else than the set of points on the boundary of the domain which uh, which are uh, closer to the set axis. So R of X, the distance of the point X to the set axis is this infimum, is, the, is this minimal distance, delta omega, and exactly the same for, for the section, the section 
uh, D, okay, of the of the axisymmetric domain, and of course this uh, this related to this this uh, R omega, uh, it's uh, it's simply this R D times S one because of the axisymmetry of the domain. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, an obvious remark is that if 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 that omega is zero, uh, if if omega if the closure of omega intersects the set axis, then the then omega intersects the set, the set axis, for example, the ball. Uh, the ball is an axisymmetric domain that intersects the set axis, and then uh, delta omega is zero. And in the case that delta omega is positive, you have that your domain is simply a product, globally a product, is this section d times t, where the closure of the section is contained in the half plane r c to infinity. So for example, a revolution torus, a torus with a, with a circular section, uh, multiplied by S1, this is, um, this is a domain where the delta omega is positive. Okay. I don't know if you have some questions about these definitions of something else that I mentioned before, you can, you can interrupt me and, and ask, please. Okay. So, uh, so we are ready to, to state the theorem that we proved, uh, as I said, with Alberto and Tiso. Uh, so this is the result. Okay, so let's consider omega, which is an axisymmetric smooth bounded domain. So, uh, and in the case, so it may intersect the set axis, like the ball, for example, in the case that it does not intersect the set axis, we further assume, uh, assume that the boundary and this set of, of, of closer points are omega to the, to the set axis are connected. So the boundary, we assume that the boundary of omega is connected and this set are omega, the set of points closer to the boundary, are connected. So under these assumptions, the domain omega cannot be locally optimal for the first positive or negative curl eigenvalues. So an immediate corollary, which is a particular cases of this assumption, is that, uh, for example, there are no smooth uh, locally optimal domains for the first positive or negative curl eigenvalues which are axisymmetric with a convex section. And in particular, the ball is not a locally optimal domain. So the ball is not, the, the torus, uh, a torus, a revolution torus uh, with a section that is convex cannot be uh, locally optimal. And uh, even perturbations of, this, uh, of these objects cannot be locally optimal or, uh, or an ellipsoid cannot be locally optimal. So this is the, the result that we have proved. And the conjecture, uh, our conjecture is that in fact, there are no smooth and uh, probably Lipschitz, even Lipschitz, uh, optimal domains for the first positive Kelayan value. So the, the, there is probably some sort of uh, domain which is, uh, which is not Lipschitz, which can be set, which can be uh, understood as optimal, but uh, it, it's not probably of Lipschitz regularity. I, I will uh, elaborate a bit at the end of my talk uh, on this conjecture. But can yeah, you ask a like, question? Like a yes. Swap? Yes. Sorry. What's the question? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Dima, go. Ah, okay. So, uh, can you have something like a sausage, which will have some sort of corner, right? Uh, <laughs> With, with corner, where I, I'm considering a smooth domains, a smooth domains, but, but, so, but, uh, so not corners, but... Uh, can you possibly have something appearing as a limit, which could be, but I have no idea. Yes, in, in, in the limit, uh, in the limit, yes. But in the limit, I think I will show you a picture of what we uh -huh. think that could be the, in the... But the singularity would not, would not be, I think, a corner, but a cusp. Type singular. Ah, I cast play. Okay. Uh, you mean what? Uh, okay, I'll show the, the picture later. Yes, this, this is probably uh, the candidate to be a, a very uh -huh. specific shape. And I'll show later. I just at the end, the very last slide of my talk will be the picture ah, of what okay. could be there. So, so. But not with Lipschitz. You know That's exists? why. Sorry? Do you know it exists? That some. Some sort of? No, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe in the, in the setting, for example, this. Um, uh, when, when people study uh, optimal domains for the for the Laplacian, the Laplacian, but not the first eigenvalue, but uh, second or, or higher eigenvalues, they, they consider this that is called quasi-open sets, right? Uh, maybe in, in some uh, 
in some uh, very general setting this exists, but I don't know. I don't know. Because um, I just wanted to, to say I've that not proved it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There may be some. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but I think that, like in a kind of formal class in some restricted settings, there are some results maybe by Bernaman on uh, extremal metrics for eigenvalues of Dirac, and mm -hmm. they are related to some constant mean curvature surfaces, uh, mm -hmm. which I always found very interesting. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, but but the, mm -hmm. this is this is a different problem. But it's also vector value. Yeah. So so uh, yeah, for the Dirac. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not for domains, but so it's different than you are. Uh, yeah, for, uh, for the metric. You're doing, but uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. so, mm -hmm. right, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, here, for example, a, a surprising, the ball, for, it, it, it's, it's somehow surprising that the ball is not uh, even locally optimal. And actually not only the ball, any, well, any convex domain. Uh, I, I'll show you a necessary condition later, uh, which shows you yeah, that uh, no convex domain does not need to be axisymmetric. In general, any convex domain cannot be uh, uh, optimal, locally optimal. So, uh, so, so, so the candidate to be uh, optimal, the optimal domain, cannot be Lipschitz, I think. It's not proof, it's not proof, but I think cannot be Lipschitz. So maybe with a cusp like singularity and cannot be, uh, cannot have uh, convexity in, in any sense, reasonable sense. Mm -hmm. I'll show you the picture later, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so maybe one last, uh, for, yes? uh, there are restricted problems, for, uh, maybe more in the Romanian setting, where you can look for extremal metrics in a conformal class, right? Uh -huh. Curl yes, is conformally yeah. covariant, so so I have no idea whether it makes and the condition that something should be normal, let's say normal to the boundary is preserved under conformal deformations. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, I'm just wondering if uh, so maybe not in the Euclidean but in the Romanian setting uh, you could get some uh, extremals kind of for yes. restrict for restricted problems. Uh, yes, yes. Possibly that, yes, that's, that mm -hmm. at least curl changes in a fairly simple way under yes. conformal the conformal factor. So that's maybe right. Maybe yeah, yeah. Use it. So, so for the usual mm -hmm. Laplacian, uh, like Ilias and Sufi and the Rashvili, uh, there is a slightly weaker condition for a metric to be extremal for Laplacian and conformal class than uh, for with respect to all metric deformations. So, uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what happens for the curl. This, this mm -hmm. just, uh, yes, yes, pr probably uh, because something that is not done, but um, yeah, special, but I think. Maybe this, this could be discussed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, for example, uh, we discussed this before. Uh, the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian on, on a free manifold, if you want, it can be decreased as, as much as you want, uh, uh, keeping the, the volume fixed. That's possible even in the conformal class, no, no problem. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it cannot grow, but it can be decreased. Uh, we don't know if the same happens for the curl, but I think it, it should be true that you can decrease. Um, and maybe a, a way of doing it, indeed, is as you said, is considering a conformal factor appropriately chosen and then decreasing the first. Uh, but it's, it's not done. There is essentially no literature. That's quite surprising. So uh, the, the, the Dirac operator has been studied a lot uh, because, of course, it's very important in in quantum field theory, in quantum stuff. But the Kell operator, which is also very important in fluids, in electromagnetism, et cetera, is not very well studied from some viewpoint. I mean, it's uh, mm -hmm. some uh, functional theoretic aspects, like uh, when it defines a self of joint operator, et cetera, it is well studied, is well understood, but not other uh, stuff like this one that I'm discussing here. So it's very, yeah, it's interesting, all these questions you, you can ask in this context, of course, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but the very first um, point that I want to observe is this. Uh, so a natural question is, is there some sort of faber cran inequality for the Kell operator domains, always domains? Uh, so yes, the point is that, well, yes and no. So let's, let's explain what I mean. So indeed, uh, both the first mu, the mu one and mu minus one are lower bounded by a constant that only depends on the volume of the domain. So this is a sort of faber cran but uh, in contrast, and you see this from the proof, uh, this is not sharp, this is far from sharp, and which explains, uh, somehow explains a bit why it's uh, complicated, uh, the problem, and why you cannot have. So in, in the classical proof of faber cran for the Laplacian, uh, you symmetrize, right? You, you, have the, you have your domain, 
and you 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 symmetrize the the level sets of the of the first eigenfunction, uh, spherical symmetrization, and you consider uh, rearrangements, and uh, the variational formulation for the for the eigenvalue uh, behaves well with respect to this uh, rearrangement and this symmetrization. Uh, so at the end of the day, what you get is that uh, is that you, you you can minimize the eigenvalue. Um, considering eigenfunctions that are spherically symmetric, right? It's very because you have symmetrized everything, the, the eigenfunctions, the domain. Uh, this is not the case for the for the Kell operator. There cannot exist, there cannot exist Beltrami fields or Kell eigen fields which have a spherical symmetry, which lie on, on spheres. That's impossible. Okay. So uh, so this picture of having the the concentric spheres with all the lines of the of the Beltrami field of the Kell operator line on these spheres is not possible here. So then things become more complicated. Anyway, uh, we have this proposition that we, we, that we showed. And uh, we have that, uh, we have this lower bound. Uh, here, notice this one over three in contrast with the uh, two over three, uh, what is it, two over three for faber cran This, you can expect this because Laplacian is somehow the square of the curl, okay, uh, vector valued. Uh, but okay, uh, but the constant in any case is totally different. So uh, let me sketch a bit the proof of this result. So we can consider the inverse of this, of the curl operator. It's a, it's a compact operator, self of join. Uh, and if you consider the, um, uh, the L2 product of curl minus one of V with V for any V, in the space of remember this k omega is the space of of uh, fields divergence free fields tangent to the boundary and orthogonal to the harmonic fields you have this uh, this bound which is very simple uh, to obtain okay similar there's a similar bound of course for the inverse of the laplacian um, and um, this this is mu minus one mu minus one actually it's negative so yes this is okay and this is achieved these inequalities are achieved uh, so this is sharp when v is the first positive or negative eigenfunction, eigenfield. Okay. So uh, we have this first observation. A second observation is that given any vector field v, uh, tangent to the boundary, divergence free, orthogonal to the harmonic um, fields, we can consider the biot savart uh, vector field, which appears in electromagnetism and in fluid mechanics, is simply defined by this integral. Okay. This is convergent. Uh, so the integral, of course, is as, as L1 log. So this is this gives you actually a, a continuous vector field on on R3. Uh, you can check that the divergence of the biot savar is zero, and the Kell of the biot savar is equal to V, because V is here for any vector field, but but yes, in this case. So now, since you have that the Kell of this biot savar is equal to V. Then uh, you have that the curl minus one and the viot savar, the difference of this and this are, are curl free, right? Because they have the same curl. So by the Hodge decomposition, you can write the curl minus one uh, as the sum of these, of these three uh, fields, the, the viot savar, some harmonic component, this is a harmonic field, and some gradient, the gradient of a scalar function, simply by Hodge decomposition for manifolds with boundary. So then, uh, using the orthogonality of uh, of uh, v with uh, with the with the harmonics and the gradients, you check that uh, this holds the, the the scalar product of these two fields. Uh, you can substitute here the biot savar, and it's the same. Okay. So now uh, you can bound the biot savar using smart inequality very easily, of course, just yes, from the definition of the of the biot savar uh, with the integral kernel. Uh, so you have this uh, inequality. And now we use now uh, the rearrangement inequality, which we symmetrize the, the omega, the domain omega, and we denote omega star is the ball center at the origin of volume omega. So the rearrangement inequality allows you to, to write uh, this integral of omega to upper bound this by uh, the integral in the symmetrization omega star. Uh, here we take the soup, and uh, the soup of this uh, is of course uh, achieved uh, when set is at the at the, band, at the center point of the sphere of the ball. Sorry, 
So this is uh, this explicit, very explicit constant. Okay. So now with this uh, simple uh, bound, uh, we can also bound this integral here, right? Which appears in the bits of our estimation. Mm -hmm. So this integral here, again, we take the we, we extract the the soup uh, of this term here, and this is the L two norm, and then using this uh, this inequality here, you get this upper bound. So we conclude uh, simply uh, using this upper bound here for the Biot Savar, we integrate uh, now uh, the Biot Savar to, to obtain uh, the L2 norm. We, we integrate on the domain omega, we obtain this, uh, this uh, other upper bound for the L2 norm of the Biot Savar. Then finally, uh, since uh, we established before that uh, this scalar product of k minus one is exactly equal to the scalar product of biot sabar applying SBARF uh, inequality, we can just bound this scalar product by the by the norm of B of, of biot sabar and the norm of B, and uh, we we achieve uh, we, we obtain this bound which holds for any for any B in this uh, this space functional space, and uh, since uh, this is an upper bound. And since um, this inequality is optimal, is sharp, it's sharp, it's exactly achieved uh, when, uh, when V is equal to U1 or U minus one, then you get uh, the bound of the statement. Okay, this implies the proposition, this bound here. Okay. So, uh, so what we have is indeed there is an inequality, but, um, but it's not sharp. And actually uh, there is no hope of having a sharp inequality of this type comparing with uh, with a ball, because as I said, uh, the curl eigenfield a curl eigenfield cannot be uh, spherical symmetric. It cannot lie on level sets on spherical level sets. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is a first observation, which is this Faber-Crane. So the reason um, for which uh, that you don't have. Uh, that some that these domains are not optimal is not that you can decrease as much as you want the the eigenvalue. This is not uh, the reason. The, the eigenvalue cannot be decreased as much as you want. Okay. So now uh, I'm going to to spend the rest of the talk uh, talking about the proof of the of the theorem. Uh, a key step is this necessary condition for optimality, and and, and this is general. This is here now in this uh, proposition that I'm going to state. The domain is not assumed to be axisymmetric. It's a general domain, smooth enough. So C2 alpha is okay. Maybe you can prove something similar for Lipschitz, or the, for Lipschitz, one has to be a bit more careful with the spectral problem. But uh, okay, at least for sufficiently smooth domains, you have the following. You have that if omega is a locally optimal domain for the first positive or negative Kell eigenvalue, then any eigenfield uh, U1 with with the corresponding eigenvalue mu one, the first eigenvalue, satisfies that its pointwise norm on, on the boundary is constant. So u1 squared at each point of the boundary is a constant for some positive constant and the same constant, even if your domain has different connected components. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a necessary condition for a domain to be optimal. So a corollary of this, is that uh, each connected component of the boundary must be diffeomorphic to a torus. Why? Because uh, U1, the, the vector field must be constant. The, the norm of the vector field must be constant on the boundary. So if the surface is not toroidal, it's not toroidal, then uh, any vector field on a, on a, on a surface of, of genus different from zero must vanish at some point. This would imply that the vector field vanishes everywhere yeah, because it's a constant. So, but we saw that uh, we cannot have solutions to the to this Kell eigenfield equation for vector fields that vanish identically on the boundary. So the conclusion is that it's necessary that uh, for an optimal domain, locally optimal, that the boundary, each component of the boundary, be diffeomorphic to the torus, at least if it's smooth enough. Okay, and also second consequence is that the orbits are geodesics with respect to the induced metric. Okay, in particular, this implies that the, the domain cannot be convex. Mm -hmm. 
So let's talk a bit about uh, the proof of this proposition. So in the proof of this proposition, I don't know if you have questions, please, please interrupt me, no, no problem at all. So um, in, the, in the proof, uh, we consider a vector field V, an arbitrary vector field that is smooth bounded in R3 and which we, we assume that is divergence free in a neighborhood of the closure of the domain. So this implies that, that the time T flow is volume preserving as far as, uh, uh, as, as T is, is small enough for, for, for conditions which are in a neighborhood of this uh, closure of omega. Okay, this is volume preserving by the condition divergence equals zero. So we can define now uh, the, the movement, the movement of omega. So phi t is the, is the flow defined by, by v. So phi t of omega, we denote it by omega t. And then the push forward, we can transport u1, the, the eigenfield u1, we transport with phi. Okay, we defined pt this way. And uh, there are some properties that you can prove. The first one is very simple. Uh, the transported field, the push forward, the push forwarded field, is still tangent to the boundary of the of the transported domain. Of course, uh, the transported field is still divergence free uh, in the domain, uh, in the new domain omega t. And uh, this is a bit more complicated to to see, but not so much. Is that uh, also, this VT, this transported field, is orthogonal to all the harmonic fields of the domain omega t. Okay, for at least for time is small enough. Mm -hmm. And so, in particular, this satisfies all the conditions to be in this uh, functional space K of omega t. So, uh, so now we consider, as I did before, the inverse of the curl operator, which is compact operator uh, TT uh, for, for each. Uh, domain omega t, okay? And we have as before that for any wk, uh, this inequality, okay? The, uh, this is the, the first eigenvalue for, for, the, for omega t, uh, the positive and the negative, okay? And this, as I, as I said before, uh, these are sharp, these inequalities, these are achieved when w is the first uh, curl eigenfield uh, for omega t, for the domain omega t. So now the lemma, this uh, I'm not going to prove, it's not so hard, but it takes uh, a couple of slides, so I'll, I'll skip it. Uh, this quantity here, this uh, numerator, when we consider, not anything, not of course, not any W, when, when we consider this VT, we call VT is the, is the vector field transported by the flow of T, the, the transportation of U1, of the vector field U1, of the eigenfield U1. Then this, uh, this scalar product with Vt is constant for all time, small enough time, and equal, of course, to, to its value uh, at t equals zero, which is precisely mu, y, mu one minus one, is the inverse of the first eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. In the case uh, that we are considering, of course, uh, u one, the first positive. If you consider the, the u minus one, then the, the eigenfield, an eigenfield corresponding to the negative eigenvalue, this would be uh, minus Oh, this would be mu minus one uh, to the minus one. Okay. So uh, this implies uh, that since this is constant, you can define this quotient. Okay, and this is equal to this constant one over mu one uh, Vt square, the norm, the L2 norm of Vt of the transported field. Now, uh, this RT is then uh, smooth with T. This was not obvious a priori that this is that the dependence of this is smooth because Vt, of course, is, it varies in a smooth way, but the inverse, since um, um, since the domain is not changing in an analytic way, is not so clear, but but of course it is smooth because it's exactly this expression and this is a smooth function of T. Uh, so then you can compute the derivative and the computation, uh, after a few computations, you obtain that the derivative at zero is precisely this, is the flux, of, of V, of the vector field that you are using to transport everything, uh, weighted with the with U1 square, okay, of the boundary. So since R at time zero is precisely mu one minus one, assume normalization of the L2 norm of the first eigenfunction of this eigenfield, okay? And omega is assumed to be locally optimal, 
this implies, sorry, this implies that uh, this derivative must be zero. If it were not zero, you could increase, decrease uh, your, uh, your quantity here, and then it could give uh, a contradiction with the fact that this is sharp, in the sense that with the fact that this is sharp, and the fact that mu one is uh, locally is the smallest, and then this quotient is the biggest, uh, the, the biggest quantity that you can have here for all t is small enough. So that's the contradiction. This implies that uh, since this is zero for all, all v, all v, this implies that this must be constant, the same constant actually on each connected component. So this proves uh, the result, the proposition that I told you. And actually this constant is positive, as I said, because otherwise the field would be zero, identically zero in the domain. And finally, the claim on the geodesics, it comes from a well-known identity uh, for Kell eigenfields. So, so you have this identity, any, any Kell eigenfield, any Beltrami field satisfies this. The, um, the covariant derivative of u1 along u1 is equal to this gradient, the gradient of u1 of u squared, this identity is general. Um, even on manifolds, actually. And um, so, uh, since u1 squared is constant on the boundary, this gradient is orthogonal, is orthogonal to the boundary. So this means that this covariant derivative of this field, which is tangent to the boundary, the induced covariant de derivative, the, the tangential part must be zero because this gradient is orthogonal. Of course, uh, a vector field whose covariant derivative with respect to itself is zero, it's a geodesic up to parameterization of the of the curves of the integral curves. Okay. Daniel, so yes. uh, there were a couple of questions about uh, yes. the argument uh, does not assume that the eigenvalue mu one or mu minus one is simple. No, 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 no. Does not need to be simple. No, no, no. no, no. Yes, that's that's why uh, that's why I said that this differentiability could be. Um, not so clear, but uh, there is no problem because at the end of the day, uh, it's this function and this is precisely, this is smooth function. But uh, I, I'm, not, uh, um, I'm not taking the derivative, for example, of the, of the eigenvalue, of the variation of the eigenvalue, yes. It doesn't need to be simple, yes. No so, so, in so in principle, uh, the first eigenvalue can be multiple. It could be multiple. Okay, let, let, me, let me tell you something about this, which is interesting. So. Uh, in general, for example, for this, for the ball, for the ball, uh, it's not, uh, it's not simple. Uh, so it, this is a difference with the, with the Dirichlet Laplacian, the first eigenvalue is simple, not for the curl in general. So a question is uh, what happens for an optimal domain in case it exists? Is it simple? I'll show you that for axisymmetric optimal domains in case they exist, <laughs> uh, it must be simple. In case there is a, a, an optimal asymmetric way, it, it must be simple. Okay, but that's not a general property of the first eigenvalue of the curl. It's not simple in general. But this is actually very surprising because normally you yeah, expect yeah. optimal domains to be multiple, mm -hmm. and somehow yeah, yeah. when when you have a multiplicity, you should be able right. to perturb yes. it in such a way that mm -hmm. one goes down and, and another goes up. So I would say that. Mm -hmm. That would be an argument uh, to uh, in in the direction of non-existence. So if you're saying mm -hmm. that it cannot be multiple, then I would. Mm -hmm. I would yes, uh, yeah. For, for the moment, for the, for the moment, we've not been able to prove in general, but for axisymmetric. But still, we we did not uh, we were not we were not able to use it to to prove a general setting. But yes, I, I agree that it's quite surprising. Yes, and I have another question. So when you are saying about. Uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, optimality for axisymmetric, do you consider only uh, do you consider any kind of perturbations? Or any kind only of perturbations. So you don't any kind of, you're not yes, restricted yes. to the class of axisymmetric. You consider anything. Anything, anything. Yeah, not restricted to the class. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That's why it was important. Uh, that why that's why it was important. This proposition, which is general, because we use this for the axisymmetric. So essentially, what we proved. Uh, so now uh, I'm telling you a bit about the proof of the of the theorem, is that uh, such fields cannot exist. There cannot exist an, an axisymmetric domain with this condition for the for the points closer to the set axis, which has an eigenfunction which is constant on the boundary. This is essentially the so so then uh, the result holds for any any perturbation of the symmetric domain, not necessarily axisymmetric, right? 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. So the proof uh, now, so, so Dima, how, how long do I have? Maybe 10 minutes? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's, let's use now the necessary condition. The necessary condition says that for smooth uh, domains, um, smooth enough domains that are optimal, locally optimal even, uh, the boundary, or each component of the boundary must be um, toroidal. So then uh, this quantity delta omega must be positive. The, the, the axisymmetric domain, now, now we are in the theorem, so now the, the domain is axisymmetric. The domain cannot intersect the set axis because if, if it intersects, there is some component, the, the outer component, which is spherical. So, so it must be, it's in contradiction with the necessary condition. So this means that omega is a product, is D times T. This is a section which is contained in the half, the closure of this D is contained in the half plane, our set. Okay, so let's assume first that U1 is axisymmetric. The eigenfield is axisymmetric, does not need to be the case. An axisymmetric domain, it could have eigenfunctions that are not, that are not axisymmetric, but let's assume first this. So then um, the, axis, the, the, the eigenfunction u1 has this expression, okay? Um, this is because it's a, it's a Kell eigenfield. So you have this, this uh, function psi, this is a scalar function. Um, so this, this part here in set and R components, this is very general for any rotationally symmetric divergence free field. This part here uh, is not general, this is, uh, this is just specific for Bertrami fields, the fact that this is linear with, with, with psi, okay? And uh, this function psi is not anything, but it satisfies um, actually a particular case of what is known as the Gratz-Shafranov equation in fluid mechanics. So it satisfies this uh, eigenvalue equation, uh, say this L psi is equal to minus mu one square psi. And this L, this operator, uh, this in the section D, this scalar opera operator, it's not the Laplacian, but it's, it's close. Well, it's not very different from the Laplacian. It's just this second order elliptic operator uh, on, on the domain D. Okay, so you have that psi satisfies this equation and it satisfies boundary conditions. The first one, uh, the first boundary condition is C1 is that psi on the boundary must be constant. And it is a constant because uh, U1 must be tangent to the boundary the psi must be constant because of this expression here. And second condition, it comes from the necessary condition, which is that U1 square must be constant on the boundary. So U1 so you square, if you compute U1 square here, you get this expression here, and you get this sort of Neumann, non-homogeneous Neumann, if you want, condition on the boundary. So this is a sort of a better determined, if you want, a condition, not only the Dirichlet uh, value is fixed, but uh, the Neumann sort of Neumann uh, condition. Okay? So we have this. Now uh, we are in the assumption that the boundary of the domain is connected. This is one of the assumptions of the theorem. Of the theorem. So since you have that omega is this product, uh, is this product uh, set d times s1, and is connected to the boundary, then there is, one can check very easily that there is only one harmonic field up to a constant factor, and it's explicitly written this way, is one over R, the rotation E phi. Okay. Now, uh, we have that the, that the Kelligen fields belong to this space K omega. So in particular, they are orthogonal to the harmonic fields, which means that this integral is zero and which gives you the, this uh, identity for this integral. So the integral of this uh, quotient must be, must be equal to zero. So then, then now using Gratz-Shafranov equation, which just means that let's integrate, let's take psi over R here and integrate and use this identity here. You get that zero is equal to this uh, integral, the integral of L psi over R. This is precisely this. You can write this just simple computation. And now integrating by parts, so I'll just, just simply integrate into the boundary. This is the flux of the gradient of psi over R with the, with the area, the, the length in this case, because it's two dimensional, uh, integrated with the length on the, on the boundary of the, of the section. So therefore this implies, okay, so what's the conclusion of this? This integral has to be zero. This means that the gradient at, must vanish at some points of the, of the boundary. 
okay, the gradient of psi. But since the gradient of, of psi must vanish at some points of the boundary, uh, so at the point where this is uh, zero, this means that C1 cannot be zero because if C1 is zero, then the gradient vanish at some point, then C2 should, should be zero. This, this first implies that C1 is not zero. And second, this uh, also implies that, uh, of course, the zero set of the gradient of psi is non-empty. And since you have that this integral must vanish, you, have, you must have change of sign on the boundary. So it should consist of at least two connected components, maybe more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now uh, the next step of the proof is what uh, can we understand this zero set of the gradient on the boundary? There is the, the answer is that yes, it's very simple to understand this zero set. So let's take a point R star set star on the zero set of the gradient. This implies this uh, identity just simply from the Neumann condition. At any point where the gradient vanishes, you have that mu one square C one square over R star square is equal to C two. This is simply what I wrote here. And uh, so therefore, if there exists, let's assume there exists another point on the boundary with R not strictly smaller than R star, then uh, then we have uh, we have this change of uh, inequalities identity. We have uh, uh, the Neumann condition evaluated at the point R not C not. Okay, this is just the Neumann condition. This is strictly bigger than substituting uh, R not by R star because of this condition. This is equal uh, since C two is equal to this. This is equal to C two plus plus this, but this is of course a contradiction. C2 plus something positive cannot be smaller than C2. So this, uh, this and the fact that set is not empty actually implies that uh, set is the, the, the set of points where the gradient vanishes is precisely given by this RD, this, this set of points on the boundary of the domain, which are closer to the set axis. There cannot be any point which is, uh, which is closest which is closer to the set axis. The points close to the set axis must be the, the critical points of the gradient on the boundary, okay? And then uh, this implies this statement because, um, because in the statement of the theorem, it was the assumption was precisely that, let me just go back. Uh, it was that if this set is connected, then this cannot be optimal. Now I've related this set with the set of critical points and uh, since the set of critical points is disconnected, then the set cannot be connected. This is under the axis symmetry assumption. This is not necessary, of course. Um, for this, we, we do something which is, I think, standard. So if, if, U is, if U1 is not axis symmetric, um, it's a vector field, a general field of this form, you can always axis symmetrize. You can introduce an axis symmetrization operator, which is just integrating in the phi variable. Hmm. And uh, so you defined the axisymmetrization uh, field. Okay. It follows that uh, since the curl commutes with uh, rotations and translations, uh, this, U, this U1s is still uh, an eigenfunction with the same eigenvalue. And actually, uh, it belongs to the, to the space k of omega. Okay. So the only thing uh, is okay, if you get, if you can prove that this uh, symmetrization field. It's not trivial, it's not zero, not identically zero, then you are done because you would have an axis symmetric vector field with, with eigenvalue uh, mu one. You apply the previous uh, discussion and you're finished. Uh, so let's prove that this cannot be identically zero, the axis symmetrization. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for this, uh, let's take a, a point on the boundary such that uh, the phi component of u1 at the point is zero. Okay, let's assume this. So uh, this, let's assume that this point exists. Then uh, the point, the, the vector field u1 on the boundary at the point p0, since the phi component is zero, is tangent to the meridian, to the meridian of the of the surface, the meridian gamma naught, okay, passing by, by p0, tangent to the meridian. But the meridians uh, are geodesics, okay? The meridians are geodesics. 
And uh, the orbits of U1, we saw in the, in the proposition before that they are also geodesics. There is uniqueness of, of geodesics passing uh, when you fix a point and when you fix a direction, uh, there's a uniqueness. So then the whole orbit gamma naught, the whole meridian is an orbit of U naught, okay? Mm -hmm. So you have proved this. Uh, so now um, you can consider then the disk bounded by this, uh, by this meridian, okay, by, by gamma naught. Uh, so, so you have the meridian and you have the, the disk uh, in the domain bounded by the meridian. And now you can apply Stokes theorem. So the circulation uh, along the meridian is not zero because well, here you are using that the, that the field is constant, not zero, the norm of the field. So you have this, this positive or negative circulation. This is Stokes theorem. Uh, this is the equation, the, the eigenvalue equation. Now, um, this n, of course, is the normal, which is just simply E phi, the, the vector field uh, perpendicular to the phi angle. And now you can, you can change this very easily, this integral over the section uh, by an integral over the whole domain. Um, why you can this, uh, this is this line. Here we are, we, we have used simply that U1 is divergence free and any divergence free, the flux through any disk phi phi naught is independent of the phi naught, does not depend on the angle. So you can easily pass from the surface from this uh, section uh, flux to this, uh, global flux, let's say, dividing by, by two pi, the, the length of the angle. So then you have this, which is uh, equal to the phi component, u1 times n is the phi component of u. And this is nothing else since we um, characterize the harmonic fields on the, on the domain. This is the, I wrote here that this is the only harmonic field of the domain. This is precisely the harmonic field H, but U1 belongs to K, and K is the space of fields that are orthogonal, H orthogonal to the harmonic field, so this is zero. This is a contradiction. This means that there is no point, there is no point where uh, on the boundary where U1, where the phi component of U1 is zero, therefore, uh, therefore uh, the symmetrization cannot be identically zero, okay, because you are integrating uh, along an angle, something, a function that does not vanish. Okay, and this concludes the proof. Okay, there is a corollary. So now I'm finishing, just give me three minutes. Uh, a first corollary is that um, under the assumption that omega is axisymmetric and, um, and, the, and the boundary is connected, then if it's locally optimal that the domain, then the eigenvalue is simple. This is related to what I said uh, before. And the corresponding eigenfunction is axis symmetric. This is, okay, I, I'm not going to, um, to prove this result, uh, but it comes from the argument as before. So uh, this is uh, this is very special, very special property of optimal domains, because in general, as I said, the first eigenvalue, curl eigenvalue of a general bounded domain is not simple. Mm -hmm. So I skip, uh, I skip the proof. Okay, so now I want to I want to finish with with this remark, this conjecture. So let's go back. Um, so I mentioned this paper by Cantarella and some co-authors. So they considered a different um, optimization problem, which is for the helicity. It, it maximizes an object instead of minimizing, but there are some connections. We are still understanding these connections, but there um, there there is. Um, there is a numerical uh, experiment which suggests that the following, let's say, Apple-like non lipschitz domain, axisymmetric actually, could be the, the optimization problem. So it's this, uh, let's, let's see if you can understand this picture. So the domain, uh, so this is the boundary of the domain, it's axisymmetric, so you are rotating. And here you see uh, that you have this, this singularity, which is cusp-like. Okay, like a square root of x, let's say. <laughs> so this is conjecture, it's not proof, this conjecture to be an optimal domain for a different optimization problem, but with some similarities. So the, the problem, the question is, if this is actually also the optimal or how it's related to the optimal domain for the first positive or negative uh, Kell eigenvalue. Uh, so could be something of this type. So here a difficulty is that this domain uh, is not Lipschitz, uh, then defining 
the appropriate uh, functional setting to define to to to, to have a good uh, operator uh, and a spectral problem is not so easy. This can be done for Lipschitz domains with casualized singularities is more delicate, the tangential conditions, etc. But it it might be that uh, this is a good candidate to be um, to be an optimal domain for the for the Kell eigenvalue for the eigenvalue of the Kell. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. There was a question from Olivier Lafitte. Uh, yeah, so his question was about U1. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it also an eigen uh, vector of minus delta? So I guess of Hodge uh, Laplacian. Yes. Uh, and with Dirichlet, or what are the boundary conditions? No boundary, yes, yes. There are two typical, yes, that's a very good question. So, so yes, it is a eigenvector, let's say, uh, or at least uh, formally it satisfies the equation Hodge Laplacian acting on U1 is equal to, to lambda square minus lambda square, depending on the how you find Hodge Laplacian uh, U1. But uh, the two conditions, there are the relative and the absolute, uh, right? Uh, this, don't, this doesn't satisfy any of, the, of this because uh, the, the, the condition, uh, so there is a condition uh, such that uh, U1 is uh, tangent to the boundary, the Hodge, the Hodge eigenfield is tangent to the boundary, but then there is a condition on the derivative, which means that the Kell is perpendicular to the boundary. That's, uh, that's the absolute, right? Absolute uh, boundary conditions for the Hodge. The field is tangent, the Kell is perpendicular. This is not the case here. The Kell is also tangent to the boundary. So, uh, so yes, not, um, there is no obvious connection between the spectral problem for the Kell uh, with these uh, boundary conditions, which are the typical and, uh, on, and the, the typical Hodge, the typical conditions for the Hodge, which are the relative and the absolute. Yes. <laughs> but for manifolds without boundary, uh, that's right. For manifolds without boundary, mm, yes, uh, any, any any Beltrami field, any Kell eigenfield is also a a Hodge eigenfield, yes. Co closed, co closed Hodge. Mm -hmm. I have two more uh, quick questions. So, uh, one, uh, is it known that uh, the spectrum of the problem is discrete for any open set? For, for any domain well, I mean without. That you don't need any regularity of the boundary in order to. to no, 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 yes, OK, no, no. Uh, no, I, I don't know. It's it's known for, for Lipschitz. Yeah, for Lipschitz is OK, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't think it's done for for domains whose boundary is not Lipschitz. Yes. Because you I see, because if, again, if this, like for Dirichlet, we know that uh, it is always true for any, for any open set. For Neumann, it is not true. So my point mm -hmm. is that. If we don't know this for Lipschitz, then it's not so clear. If this is not true for Lipschitz, then it's mm -hmm. not so clear uh, what does it mean uh, if you have essential spectrum, what does it mean to have the first positive eigenvalue? Yes, that, that's, right? Uh, that's right. Yes, yes, that's, yeah, that's related to what I said, that what means uh, to have a candidate that is not uh, Lipschitz, right. maybe it's finding a sequence. OK, I, I understand um, in this way, it's finding a sequence of smooth domains uh, that That's converge. And, That's right. Yeah, in, 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 in this sense, but it, but it's totally true. It's uh, it's only done for the Lipschitz. Without the Lipschitz assumption, it's very unclear. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, another question: Did uh, you or any, anyone try to do any numerics for this problem? Yes, yes, yes. No, not me nor Alberto because we don't know much about numerics. But it's uh, the, the, actually this figure that. Um, that appears here is done by, it was done several years ago, but by some people, Cantarella and other, and other people, but it's for a different problem. So I, right. I'm not sure actually, I, it's related, uh, but for example, there is something here, they, they, you can see a difference. For example, this is uh, the lines, here is the picture of the lines of, of what would be the, the, the eigenfield for this different operator, okay? Here you see that this is, um, that is ro rotating in the same direction for all the for all the tori. Let's say it's rotating in the same direction. So this has positive flux across a, a section. Positive flux. Mm -hmm. Okay. This cannot be the case for a Kell eigenfield uh, because it's, it's orthogonal to the 
to the harmonic. So it's, it's, it's zero. The integral uh, across this section must be zero. So, so, so this is not, by no means, this is um, a colliding field for an optimal domain in some sense. But still, the domain could be similar to what would one would happen for the for our problem. But uh, but not not much is done. Yes, apart from this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I guess there was a remark uh, uh, from Matteo Capaferi that uh, uh, there is some earlier work on spectral properties of curl by uh, Yuri Safarov uh, before uh, Giga Yoshida. Aha, uh -huh, okay, I didn't know. It's uh, okay, and they, they, it's proved uh, essentially the same sort of result, or I didn't know what what's the name of the of the uh, author. Mateo, could, could you unmute? Maybe you can just... Uh... Yeah, I, I, I put a link in the chat. It's Yuri ah, okay. Safarov. Yeah. Ah, okay. Safarov. Okay, okay. No, I didn't know this. A, uh... As a floating behavior of the spectrum of Maxwell operator. Uh, okay, okay. It's uh, 84. So, yeah, so. Yeah. 84, okay. Comment. It's Dima Vasilyev. So it was Safarov's uh, PhD thesis. So Safarov's PhD thesis in 1984 was devoted to this subject. After that, he had a student, a PhD student, uh, by the surname Guriev, and I was external examiner for that thesis. It also it was around 1990. There, there are there is a paper of Guriev available on the internet, and he also studied uh, curl. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, very interesting, yes, because it's, uh, in general, uh, people cite this Giga, this Giga Yoshida for this um, self adjoinness and the good spectral setting. Uh, so, yeah, also, I'll have a look to see. Also, in 2016, there was a memorial issue of the Journal of Spectral Theory, you know, Yuri Safarov died pretty young. So there was a mm -hmm. memorial issue of Journal of Spectral Theory, which I edited. And I wrote an extended preface, and I mentioned in this preface uh, that uh, Curl was the subject of Safarov's PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's also available as a preprint, my preface to the memorial issue, so you don't have to pay money to read. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that, that's good. I'm poor, so <laughs> I cannot pay much. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I have a look also at the thesis of Safarov. Yeah. You can't look at it because it's in Russian. I have it in uh, ah, okay, no, form, then, uh, but, uh, uh, right. but you can look at the paper at least. Uh, okay, yes, sure. Yes, yes, I, I'll do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there uh, any other questions or comments? So if not, well, uh, let's thank Daniel again for a great talk. And Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And, and of course, if you have, uh, as I said, the problem is wide open. Uh, any contribution, uh, it's okay, uh, it's perfect. So uh, if you can solve, uh, <laughs> we don't know how to, to, to make more progress at this moment, at least. <laughs>